a warm welcome to PSPC's 8.45 a.m. service. Um, while we prepare to worship the Lord, um, let us quieten our hearts as we hear the call to worship taken from Psalm 96, verses 1 to 9. We'll read this responsively. I'll start with the odd-numbered verses, and I invite the congregation to respond with the even-numbered verses in bold. Verse 1. O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvellous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his name. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come to his court. Together, worship, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. And just as the psalm we have read celebrates God's kingship and holiness over all the earth, so too should we come together in celebratory fashion to worship and praise our great and holy God. So please stand to join me in singing our opening song. gathered as your people to hear your word, we come into your presence and we lay aside our, wor our worries and preoccupations to experience afresh the joy of salvation which we now have because of Jesus' sacrificial work on the cross. So as we come into your holy presence, 
we lift up our broken and contrite hearts and exchange them for hearts renewed and transformed. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Before our holy God now, let us spend some time in quiet confession and we'll come together for a corporate prayer after that. Let us draw our prayers to a close so that we can pray this corporate prayer together. Together, next slide, please. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Having confessed our sins, let us now hear the assurance of pardon taken from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 7 to 8. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Our next song is one that conveys both praise and deep prayer in being captured by God's divine grace. As the fount of every blessing, God extends His grace to us in seeking us when we were strangers. And our next song speaks of how Jesus has washed us clean with His precious blood and rescued us from danger while we were trapped in sin. And so God's grace doesn't end just there because Jesus' atoning sacrifice is for sins past, present, and future. For he binds our wandering hearts to thee and seals them for thy courts above. So please stand to join me in singing the next song. To sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy To thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and 
and I know Thy hand will bring me safely home by Thy good grace. Jesus, on me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, He to rescue me from danger interposed His precious blood. To grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Oh, let thy goodness, thy governor, by my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. And our next song reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross as the man of sorrows. So as we sing, may we be moved by the depths of his love and sacrifice to continue in our worship. Hallelujah. 
stone is rolled away, behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah. Jesus' death and resurrection. For as we read in today's passage, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. His is a spiritual kingdom that stretches on through eternal days. And as God's redeemed people, we look forward to, joyfully, this kingdom where Jesus, the man of sorrows, now exalted, shall reign. Successive journeys run. His kingdom stretched from shore to shore till such are eyes and set no
at this juncture now, I'd like to warmly welcome anyone who may be worshipping with us for the first time so that we can warmly welcome you. Can I invite you to do something very brave and that is to raise your hands so that we can acknowledge you. I see a newcomer. Welcome, welcome. And if there is anyone else on the wings or online um, who is tuning in for the first time, please do scan the QR code that you see on screen so that we can connect with you further and um, continue to welcome you to our church. That said, um, let's stand to greet each other now and pass on the peace and pardon that we have received from God. Thank you for doing that. We have some time now for the giving of offering. Um, the offering can be given through electronic means if you'd like to scan the QR code that you see on screen. Um, and if you'd like to adopt the symbolic gesture of um, placing your offering into an envelope and dropping it in the box, you can do so on your way out later. There's one box in the front and one at the back. So let's take some time to do that now. for the doxology. gifts that you have given us and for the opportunity we have to offer them back to you. Beyond these materials, Lord, we thank you for the grace and mercy which we have received and for Christ's perfect sacrifice on the cross. So as we lift up this offering to you, Lord, would you restore a right spirit from within? Teach us to be good stewards with everything you place under our care and help us to find our hope and strengthen you alone. Teach us to have hearts of thanksgiving, Lord, and help us to daily offer our lives as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, blessed morning, my brothers and sisters who are gathered on site online. Uh, we bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let us turn to the church news in the bulletin. As we draw near to our anniversary service, we are pleased to highlight the commemorative event for this month. Uh, PSBC worship team will be involved in the National Day Thanksgiving service organised by the National Council of Churches of Singapore on this coming Thursday, 17th of August 7.45pm in the evening at St. Andrew's Cathedral, New Century. 
A congregants who have already registered may be seated at the, se- the section designated for PSPC. Uh, all other congregants uh, uh, are welcome, even though you have not registered to come. Uh, but bec- because uh, you, you, uh, we have already designated the se- section for PSPC, if you are able to come on that day itself, you will be seated in non-designated uh, section, in other words, free seating. But nonetheless, do join us if you are able to. A complimentary parking is available at St. Andrew's Cathedral and light refreshments will be served after the service. Uh, PSBC is one of the most historic churches in Singapore and let us come together with the larger Christian community in Singapore to worship God together and to pray for the country on the occasion of National Day. So all are welcome. Uh, Do join us on this coming Thursday evening. Next, we are pleased to publicise two upcoming events on this coming Saturday, uh, 19th of August. PSPC is in the midst of the civic district, surrounded by arts and music community. Therefore, it has always been our vision to reach out to this community through the Arts Fellowship and our Music Fellowship. On this coming Saturday morning at 9am, join us in the upper room at level 3, as our congregant Clifford Chua, uh, who is both an artist and an arts educator, will share about the Christian understanding of the arts. And he will also use his art piece, which was featured at the Tenebrae Reflections uh, on Good Friday itself, to show us how arts and our Christian faith can be integrated. So do register via the QR code as soon as possible and join us on this coming Saturday morning. Next, another event that is happening on this coming Saturday also, on 19th of August at 9am as well, is a newly launched initiative known as Mami Saka. We invite new um, mothers to join us in this breakfast fellowship so that you can receive emotional and spiritual care and support from one another. And the infant's room will be open for the fathers and caregivers if you are unable to find alternative car, uh, childcare arrangement, the, we open the infant's room for you to use. So the fathers can be in the infant's room with your children and you can maybe form your own daddy circle or whatever. Just, you know, daddy circle, yeah. For catering purposes, uh, please register via the QR code for uh, the team to look into the catering for the breakfast. Next, here in PSBC, we have something for everybody in every season of life. The Senior Members Fellowship is inviting all seniors in PSPC to a lunch fellowship on the 31st of August at 12.15pm here in PSPC Fellowship Hall. And all seniors are invited and it will be a wonderful opportunity to reconnect with one another. Um, For catering purposes, please do register at the sign-up table in the fellowship hall as well. Next, after two talks on Presbyterian history in July and uh, Presbyterian distinctives in August, we draw near to our anniversary month of September. And the highlights for September, in addition to the service, is the Reverend Benjamin Kisbury Lecture on Presbyterian Missions in Colonial Singapore, Legacy and Inspiration for Today. It will be on the 2nd of September, Saturday afternoon, 2 p.m. here in the Century. And the speaker is Reverend Dr. Andrew Pei, a TTC lecturer whose research expertise is on colonial missions. So come and be inspired by how the Lord has used pioneer Presbyterian missionaries to plant churches And when we know about our mission's history, we can be inspired to continue the mission. Uh, Do sign up via the QR code as soon as possible because this event will also be publicised to the larger English Presbytery community because we share a common history of uh, Presbyterian missions. The next slide, these are the rest of the announcements which we commend to you for your reading and response. Especially, we appeal for your generous giving in response to the PSPC half-year financial update as well as the GB fundraising brochures which are available from the Arches table.
So these are the announcements which we commend to you. And the next slide contain the prayer points which we will bring before God as the gathered people of God. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. O God, our Father, we give thanks to you for your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, because through the cross, we have redemption. And through the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit, we are gathered here as your people to worship you. We give thanks for your bountiful blessings that flows out of your goodness. As as Singapore celebrated our 58th National Day, we give thanks for the ways that you have blessed this country with social political stability and that all peoples can live in peace and harmony and that your people can live out our Christian life. We give thanks for the privilege given to this church to lead the National Day Thanksgiving service. We pray for God's grace to be upon our worship team so that their ministry and service will bless the larger Christian community as we gather together to worship God and to pray for this country. Lord, we give thanks for the upcoming events in PSPC. We uphold the Arts Fellowship event in prayer that it will enhance our understanding and appreciation of how our Christian faith can integrate with the arts to express our worship to God, to nourish our spiritual life and to witness to the world. We pray that the vision that you have given to this church to be a beacon of light to the arts and music community in this civic district will continue to allow us to shine for Christ and bear much fruit. Lord, we also give thanks for the new initiative of the Mami Circle to provide emotional support and spiritual care for new mothers in this journey of parenthood. We pray that you will take PSPC another step forward to become a caring, supportive church community that supports everyone in every season of life. Lord, as we intercede for the needs of one another in this church, we give thanks that we can follow up from our Missions in Focus Month with a missionary care trip to Wulan, who is serving in Taiwan. We uphold Elder Evelyn Lo and Connie Sabellos in prayer, asking for journey mercy for them as they travel, and that this trip will be greatly used by God to convey our care and support for Wulan's ministry so that together we will press on to continue the mission. Lord, we rejoice with Justin and Sharon Chua for the arrival of their newborn, Jamie Chua. We pray for God's blessings upon this family in this major milestone and that you will supply your wisdom and strength to be upon Justin and Sharon, as they bring the daughter up in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Lord, as we remember those who need your healing grace, we give thanks that Reverend Calvin Chen had completed his knee replacement surgery and Ko Hui Bin had completed her surgery. We pray for the outpouring of your healing grace to be upon them so that they will recover their full mobility. And we also ask for the supply of strength for their family members as they provide care for them. Lord, as we turn our attention to the needs of this world, a world that is broken and in need of our intercession, we uphold the African country of Niger in prayer as the military coup has overthrown the government and continued to plunge the country in a political gridlock. We pray that the international community will be able to bring about peace and stability to this country and that the Christian community will be able to stand firm through faith in Christ in the midst of this turmoil. So for the peace and stability of Niger and for the sake of your people who are suffering, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us spend some moments to intercede for ourselves and our loved ones.
God, we bring before you our prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from John chapter 18, verse 1, to chapter 19, verse 16. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, One of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. 
Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken, to show by what kind of death he was going to die. His headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews! And struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The ch chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he del delivered him over to them to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The first part of this sermon was written not by me, but by Johann Sebastian Bach almost exactly 300 years ago. I want to begin this morning by playing you part of the opening chorus of Bach's St. John Passion. Not the Matthew Passion, wait for it, <laughs> not the Matthew Passion, which may be more familiar to you, but the John Passion. The St. John Passion is a musical and choral presentation of the account of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion as narrated in chapters 18 and 19 of John's Gospel, which is our text for today. It would have first have been played and sung in the St. Nicholas Church in Leipzig in North Germany on Good Friday, 1724, as part of the regular worship on that day. The opening chorus begins in a mood of deep grief. We hear repeated notes in the bass instrument, like a fast heartbeat. The violins play swirling patterns of notes, which give a sense of foreboding and distress. And over this fast-moving music, oboes and flutes play two long, slow lines, lines which intertwine and clash with each other suggesting the agony of crucifixion. The bass line begins to sink. The music gradually becomes louder. It builds up to the entry of the choir, and then the choir comes in. Listen now to the first three or so minutes of this opening chorus. I think you may find that Bach has got to the heart of John's gospel in a way that my words will struggle, struggle to match. The words the choir sings are in German, but I've given you an English translation in the sermon notes, and after you've heard the music, I will read out the translation for those of you who don't have the notes before you.
Well, I don't know if that's the kind of music you regularly listen to. Um, if you do like classical and Baroque music and you don't know the St. John Passion, why not listen to it sometime on YouTube? There are plenty of good performances on YouTube. Speaking for myself, it is my practice to play the St. John Passion through and listen to it on Good Friday. And I have to say that this music, not just the opening chorus, but the entire nearly two hour work, moves me more deeply than most Good Friday sermons I've ever heard. That's partly due to the difference between music and the spoken word, of course. Music can direct, act directly on our nerves in a way that speech does not. But reflect on what you've just heard. The orchestra begins with this grief-filled music. Everything is dark and troubled. But when the choir makes their first powerful entry, their first words are about Jesus as exalted Lord, Jesus as the eternal Son of God ruling over all creation. Lord, our Lord, whose glory fills the whole earth, show us by your passion that you, the true eternal Son of God, triumph even in the deepest humiliation. Yes, the notes of passion and humiliation are present. How could they not be? But there's this, this astonishing and quite unexpected focus on divine sovereignty. One recent book on Bach describes the opening chorus in this way. With the entry of the chorus, something of unexpected, shocking power occurs. In place of words of lamentation, Bach introduces a song of praise to the universal reign of Christ. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The voices enter together in three isolated stabs. Lord, Lord, Lord. This is an evocation of Christ in majesty, looking down on the maelstrom of distressed, unregenerate humanity below. Bach's music highlights a contrast between the godlike Christ lifted up on the cross and drawing all men to him and his abasement brought low for the sake of humankind. Jesus' majesty is thus proclaimed, as one contemporary of Bach put it, behind the curtain of his sufferings. Putting it more simply, in this music, we see Christ both as suffering servant and as Lord. I find that a convincing interpretation of the opening chorus of the St. John Passion. And I think that in turn, Bach shows himself to have been an insightful reader of John's Gospel. By bringing here together music of profound lamentation and words which proclaim Christ as Lord, Bach has captured something fundamental in John's Gospel. The whole of John's Gospel, after all, brings together these themes of sovereignty and suffering. Jesus, on the one hand, is the eternal Son of God, the Lord who comes to earth to carry out the Father's purposes, the one completely in control of his own fate. Jesus knows when his time has come, he knows that he will return to the Father, having accomplished the Father's will. That's one side of Jesus as John's Gospel presents him to him. But on the other hand, Jesus is the suffering servant, the one whom many of his own people cannot understand, the one whose message provokes opposition and hatred, the one who is finally rejected, humiliated, tortured, and crucified. That's the other side of Jesus as we read about him in John's Gospel. Any, interpret of, any, any interpretation of John's Gospel, then, must do justice to both of these themes, sovereignty and suffering. In what follows, I'd like to trace these two themes through today's text, John's account of Jesus' arrest and trial. And I will then consider how these themes of sovereignty and suffering look as we consider the contemporary world and reflect upon our own lives. As Jesus is arrested at the beginning of John 18, who has the true authority? Who is in control of what happens? At first sight, we might say that it is those 
who have come to arrest Jesus who are in control. Judas has brought with him a large group of soldiers and servants of the chief priests and Pharisees. They're all carrying lanterns and torches and weapons. They seem to be well equipped, prepared to deal with anything that may arise. But none of this takes Jesus by surprise. He doesn't try to run away. He even steps forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he, Jesus replies. Or more simply, I am. And that brief answer raises loud echoes in our minds. They rem that it reminds us of all the I am sayings in previous chapters. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. Going back into the Old Testament, those two words remind us of that narrative in Exodus 3, where God tells Moses, I am who I am. Thus shall you say to the Israelites, I am has sent you. Jesus is the one who, before he was born as a human being, had been in the Father's presence for all eternity, sharing in the divine nature. That's the deepest meaning of that simple answer, I am. And something of this seems to come across to the group which has come to arrest him because we read that when Jesus gave his answer, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Briefly, at least, they seem to realize that they're in the, they're in the presence of someone who is more than simply human. In the Bible, falling to the ground is the right response when you are in God's presence. But again, Jesus asks, who are you looking for? And again comes the reply, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, here I am then, says Jesus, the one you're looking for. You can let these other people go. And that's what they do. They take Jesus away, leaving his disciples behind. When Peter draws his sword to defend him, Jesus tells it to him to put it away. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? Who has the real authority in this scene? Who is in control here? Surely Jesus, who willingly surrenders himself to those who have come to arrest him. The scene shifts. Jesus has been bound and led away. He now stands in the high priest's presence. He's being questioned about his teaching. And again, we might think that the true authority in this scene belongs with those who are questioning Jesus. They can do what they like with him. They can use any means to compel him to answer their questions. When Jesus gives an answer that they don't like, a servant hits him in the face. You're standing in the presence of the high priest. Watch what you say. Jesus is not overawed or intimidated. Did I give a wrong answer, he asks? Then tell me what is wrong about it. But if I answered right, why did you hit me? Who is in control here? Who has authority? Once again, Jesus, and not the men whom we might, whom we might have thought of describing as the authorities here. It's not that Jesus is invulnerable. It's not that Jesus cannot suffer pain. When he's roughly handled, when his hands are bound, that hurts him as it would hurt any of us. When the high priest's servant hits him, he feels the pain. And there is a different sort of pain here too, the pain of P Peter's betrayal. As Jesus is telling the truth, Peter is outside telling lies to save his skin. No, I'm not one of his disciples. I wasn't in the garden with him back then. And so Jesus must face his accusers alone, apart from this unnamed disciple who's mentioned in verse 16. This is a further aspect of Jesus' suffering, that there is basically no one, no one with him when he draws near to his terrible time of trial. Jesus is brought before Pilate, the Roman governor. If they want to put Jesus to death, the Jewish authorities will have to persuade Pilate to give the order. Pilate in interrogates Jesus. So, you're the king of the Jews. His tone is ironic, I think. 
Jesus doesn't look much like a king. This man who now stands before him, abandoned by all his followers. Yes, says Jesus, I have a kingdom, but it's not a kingdom like any of those you know about. It's not like Herod's kingdom. I'm not like the emperor in Rome. My kingdom is not from this world. It does not come from here. There's an, import, there's an important detail of translation here. Jesus does not say, my kingdom is not of this world, as the ESV puts it. That might imply that Jesus' kingdom is an entirely otherworldly, spiritual kingdom, which has nothing to do with this world. But that is not true. Jesus, after all, taught his disciples to pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is meant to be a reality within our present world not in some other part of the universe or in some other dimension of reality. But this kingdom originates with God and not within the world. It is not a product of the world, that world which in John's thought is marked by wickedness and rebellion against God. As one commentator has put it, Jesus is denying that his kingdom has a this-worldly origin or quality he is not denying that it has a this-worldly destination. That is why he has come into the world himself and why he has sent and will send his followers into the world. His kingdom doesn't come from this world, but it is for this world. So yes, Jesus does answer Pilate by speaking of his kingdom. Ah, says Pilate, so you are a king then. You can call me that if you like, replies Jesus, but I wasn't born into this world in order to conduct myself like any king you may be familiar with. I came to testify to the truth, the truth about God and God's purposes for humanity. Truth, says Pilate. You want to talk about truth? He seems to be mocking Jesus again, as much as to say, my goodness, truth. Well, good luck with that in this world of conflicting views and opinions and aims. Maybe there's an also an implied threat. Listen, Jesus, I'm the one who decides truth here. If I say you die, you die. If I say you're released, you're released. Don't talk to me about truth. Well, how do you think this exchange between Jesus and Pilate has gone? Pilate seems to have held his own, we might think. One all, we might say, using footballing terms. But then Pilate goes out to the crowd, the Jewish leaders and those who have gathered with them. He tells them that he finds Jesus not guilty, but he senses that this is not what they want to hear, and so he caves in. He sacrifices every principle of justice. He offers them a choice. Jesus or Barabbas? Jesus the king of the Jews or Barabbas the bandit? The crowd choose Barabbas. Pilate begins to execute the sentence against Jesus. He hands Jesus over to his soldiers and has him flogged and humiliated. But it's clear that Pilate really does not want to go through with this. It's as though he hopes that flogging Jesus will be enough to satisfy the crowd. Again, he brings out Jesus before them. I find no case against him. But the crowd, led by the chief priests and their servants, will have none of this. You've got to put him to death. He claimed to be the Son of God. And Pilate is now badly frightened. Again, he questions Jesus, Jesus who is now battered and bleeding after his flogging. Where are you from? Meaning, who are you? Who sent you? What kind of a man are you? Jesus doesn't answer. So Pilate, Pilate attempts to invoke his authority. Don't you know who I am? I'm the Roman governor. Your fate is in my hands. I can decide whether to release you or put you to death. Then Jesus does answer. No, Pilate, you don't have the real power here. Your power was given you from above, that is, 
by God. And you are misusing that power. You're not the worst offender here. Those who have handed me over to you are acting more wickedly than you. They're resisting the truth in a way that you're not. But you are in the wrong, Pilate. You're guilty of sin. You will be held accountable for how you're misusing your power. These are incredible words for a man who's just been flogged to address to the governor who can decide his fate. Pilate does go on to pass sentence of death upon Jesus. But who really passes judgment on whom in this scene? Surely it is Jesus who passes judgment on Pilate. He has the true authority here. Final judgment rests with him, not Pilate. Once more, Pilate confronts the crowd. Here is your king. Do you want me to crucify your king? He's not our king, they reply. Yes, he claimed to be our king, but we've never accepted his claim. Caesar, the Roman emperor, Caesar is our king. We are loyal to Caesar. And if you don't execute this man who has challenged Caesar's authority by claiming to be a king, then you are being disloyal to Caesar. This is breathtaking hypocrisy. The Jewish religious authorities were no friends of Caesar, this pagan ruler whose armies had defiled their land. But they're quite willing to invoke Caesar's name in order to have Jesus put to death, to put an end to this man who has challenged their authority and, as they see it, has led many of the people astray. And so they hand over Jesus, the one who truly was their king, the true son of God, the Messiah sent to bring them to deliverance, to the Roman governor. And the Roman governor hands Jesus over to be crucified. But who has the true authority here? Pilate? No. Pilate's weakness becomes more and more apparent as the narrative progresses. The Jewish religious authorities? No, they have, em they have emerged as a bunch of shameless pragmatists, willing to make any compromise, willing even to pretend loyalty to Caesar in order to maintain their own power. The true authority throughout today's texts rests with Jesus. Jesus, the one who willingly goes to death, who surrenders himself to those who have come to arrest him. Jesus, who conducts himself with dignity before his accusers, who remains unswerving in his commitment to the truth, that truth that he came to testify about. Jesus suffers terrible things in today's text. He will go on to suffer yet more terrible things. Yet true sovereignty in today's text belongs with Jesus. Jesus, who goes to his death willingly, Jesus knowing what it, will, what, what it will cost him, but knowing that it is only through his death that God's salvation can become a reality for sinful men and women like us. And that is how John's gospel will end. John goes on to describe Jesus' death and burial, but he will end his gospel by telling us how Jesus rose from the dead, how by his resurrection Jesus has defeated the power of evil and brought a new world into being. The true power, the true sovereignty in today's text and indeed throughout John's gospel belongs with Jesus, the Lord of this world, who overcomes death and offers new life to all who will believe in him. So Johann Sebastian Bach got it right. Yes, the suffering, the tragedy, the grief, but also the sovereignty. The God who raised Jesus from the dead, who responded to the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus, that supreme manifestation of human wickedness with resurrection power and the offer of forgiveness, the God who did these things is a God who can do anything. This God can bring triumph out of the most appalling tragedy.
But does that all lie in the past? What about today? How does today's text relate to us? Well, there's no doubt that suffering is still with us. The modern world is a troubled place. Our environment shows signs of collapsing. Coral reefs, which play a large part in the health of our seas, seem to be under stress as the temperature of the oceans rises. It's been suggested, suggested that the Gulf Stream, that flow of warm water uh, eastwards across the, the North Atlantic, may switch itself off if the Greenland ice cap melts. And if that happens, it could have terrible knock-on effects, leading to droughts in other parts of the world. We're seeing more and more extreme weather events. Different parts of the world are experiencing unprecedentedly high temperatures. Terrible storms wreak havoc, most recently in Japan and Korea. And yet progress towards net zero carbon emissions is still alarmingly slow. We're not doing enough to keep the target of, meet the target of keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Food production is going to be affected by climate change. Already the world food supply chains are under strain. These supply chains are fragile. There isn't much flexibility or resilience in them. If a crop fails in one part of the world or if there's a blockage in the supply chain, that has knock-on effects elsewhere. Think of India's recent ban on the export of rice. Think of how the war in Ukraine has sh threatened the shipping of wheat through the Black Sea, which is one of the bottlenecks in the supply chain. Food prices will almost certainly rise and mass starvation will continue to threaten the populations of many of the poor, poorer countries. And then, of course, there are wars. There is political oppression, which adds to the growing stream of refugees across this world. We may be relatively well insulated from these things in Singapore, but there's a lot of suffering in the world today. Putting the point differently, and in biblical terms, Idolatry is rampant in the world today. Not so much the worship of physical images, though that does take place, but the pursuit of the, of the false gods of the modern world. Some do all they can to gain power and maintain themselves in power. Think of the insane behavior of some of the world's political leaders. Some are driven by greed. They aim to get as much as they can of the good things in life. And they don't care who may suffer as, as a result. Others pursue sexual fulfillment, anesthetizing themselves against the troubles of the world around them by soaking their senses in sexual pleasure. Yet others devote their energies to the cult of the self, exploring the imagined riches of their own personality, turned inwards rather than outwards towards others and towards God. And all this while, human suffering multiplies. And Christians are caught up in it. Imagine what it is like to be a Christian in North Korea today, or in Myanmar, or in many parts of Africa, where Christians are being persecuted and killed by Islamist militants. Again, this may be remote from our experience in Singapore but some of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world are facing terrible hardship and oppression. Recently, I've been reflecting on how lucky, or maybe the better term is how blessed, how blessed I was to be born in Britain in the 1950s. Looking back, we had everything really, political stability, economic prosperity, social security, free education, we just took all that for granted. But that simple fact of when and where I was born puts me right up there among the highest percentiles in, all, in one of the most privileged group of human beings that have ever lived. And the same applies to many of you born here in recent decades, in the period when Singapore has been enjo enjoying remarkable economic growth. 
But that is not any comfort for you younger people here today who still have most of your lives to live. We do not know what lies ahead. What may happen this century? Things seem very uncertain, and not even the Singapore government can make plans against every eventuality. One thing I will say, we cannot presume that God at a certain point will step in to spare us and to spare this world from the consequences of our folly. Do we imagine that if global warming goes above 1.5 degrees, then God is going to suck the excess carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere and dump it in outer space? Do we imagine that if Vladimir Putin actually carries out his mad threat of using nuclear weapons, then God will ensure that all the weapons malfunction or, or explode in a, in a shower of rose petals. Uh, I, I'd like to believe it, but I fear it would, be, it would be presumptuous. Think of all the horrors which stalked human history in the 20th century, and then ask yourselves, am I certain that the 21st century cannot be even worse? I'm not a prophet. I claim no special divinely inspired insight into the future. And I've no desire to depress any of you here unduly, particularly the younger people here this morning. I, I don't want to fill anyone here with a paralyzing sense of hopelessness. But this century may turn out to be an unusually challenging one. Now, we Christians believe that God is sovereign. Sovereign over the world he has made. Sovereign over everything in the world. Some of you will have attended the Reverend Calvin, Kelvin Chen's presentation on Presbyterian distinctives. One of the things he talked about was divine sovereignty. That doctrine is part of Presbyterian belief. Will we still hold on to that belief if things start to go even more seriously wrong than they are at present? If natural systems collapse, if there is mass starvation, if there are huge refugee populations fleeing to the remaining habitable parts of the world, will we continue to believe that God is still in control? I hope that we will. Perhaps that will be all that we, or later generations of Christians, will have left to cling to. Certainly, I believe that the Christian teachings of resurrection, of a new heaven and of a new earth that God will bring in at the last day, the Christian vision of a restored creation and a restored humanity that will inhabit it, I believe that these teachings will seem more and more precious as the days go by. Maybe there will be a mass turning to Christ during this coming century. Perhaps many will realize that there is nowhere else, or I should say no one else, to turn to. And we should remember how the story ends in John's Gospel and in the other Gospels come to that. The story ends not with death and hopelessness, but with new life and forgiveness, with a risen Savior promising his disciples that he will be with them and with all those who believe in their message, will be with them right to the end. Remember the Christ of today's text the Christ who goes determinedly to his death, ready to face the worst that his enemies can throw at him, confident that God will raise him up to glory, and, as John 20 and 21 will tell us, vindicated in his belief by resurrection from the dead. Here, in Jesus, is a suffering, sovereign saviour in whom we can put our trust. I was going to say something about Psalm 34, uh, particularly the second half of the psalm, which encourages us to look to God in all circumstances. But I think I'll leave that reference to you to follow up for yourselves if you want to. Our hymn of response is number 284 in the Presbyterian hymnal. O God, what you ordain is right. The first verse reads, O God, 
what you ordain is right, your holy will abiding. I shall be still whatever you do and follow where you are guiding. You are my God, though dark my road, you hold me that I shall not fall. Wherefore to you I leave it all. It is a simple hymn, but it takes up the themes of sovereignty and suffering and trust in God from today's text. The tune may not be familiar, so I've asked the musicians to play it through before we sing. Presbyterian hymn 284. Let us send for the closing hymn. receive God's blessings. Let us all go forth to live our lives under God's dominion and sovereignty because come what may, what God ordains is right. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.
Let's be seated, my brothers and sisters. Come to the end of the service and let the post to minister to us as we continue our prayer, our response and our meditation. After the post to anyone who would like to be prayed for, can come forward. God's peace and blessings be with you. Amen.